All right, UFC 301 is in the books, and honestly, a really good card. A really good card, considering the fact that, you know, obviously, you know, star power-wise, it's a huge drop-off from UFC 300, but, you know, this was all to be expected. That being said, though, this card delivered, and it was really solid. Had great performances, lots to take away from it, and of course, controversy. And let's get right into it. The main event, Pantoja versus Urseg. A lot of people upset. They think Urseg should have won. They think one of the judges' scorecard was crazy that they had Pantoja up by multiple rounds, not just by one. But look, it's a close fight. Let's get right into it. You know what happened. So early in the fight, it seemed that Pantoja thought that he was going to bully Urseg. It seemed the way he was moving, just rushing Urseg right away, just kicking his leg, rushing into him with those shots like boom, 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 and then grabbing him. It seemed like Pantoja was acting like Urseg was a bomb. He's like, look, this guy is not on my level. I'm just going to bully him down and control him, and I'm going to dominate this fight. And, you know, he, he did have a good first round. He was fairly dominant. But then as the fight progressed, fairly quickly, Urseg was able to adjust and get his rhythm going. And then on the feet, he was really piecing up Pantoja and hurting him bad with some of those shots with the hooks. And a lot of I think a lot of those shots, and this could play into the part of the judging, a lot of those shots, Pantoja just walked right through. He just walked right through those shots and kept going to try to get the takedown, hold on, get position, etc. But Urseg was landing some really clean shots. But a lot of that, you know gets you know maybe not seen from the judge's perspective us because we get to see replays we get to see different angles the judges don't so i can see that they didn't see the impactful shots maybe that ursek did especially in the earlier rounds because pantoja just walked right through it but those were legit shots and they hurt him especially when you look into the third round and stuff like that when that elbow came in that shot undoubtedly really messed pantoja up not just from the bleeding standpoint and the cut you could tell immediately when he got hit with that, he touched his face. He's like, what Like, what was that? Like, he was, he was checking. And then even, you know, in between rounds, he looked shaken up. And then going into the fourth round, you could tell he was backing up more. He was, he was different after that one elbow. But even so, there was a couple for sure rounds for Pantoja and then Urseg, which were, I would say, rounds one, four, and then five. Rounds two and three is where it gets kind of close. And then you kind of get into that debate of the control time versus the damage. You know, to me, I thought it was 2-2 going into the fifth. I thought that fifth round is is where that fight was going to be settled. But a lot of people had Urseg up 3-1, and then the commentary had Pantoja up 3-1. So I think it comes down to those rounds two and three where people start to debate more how much, obviously, that elbow in round three was super impactful. But from the judges' perspective, they don't hear everything else. They don't see everything. I don't know. You know, I can understand them not noticing that elbow as a big of a deal as it actually was. To me, it was a really close fight, and it was a back and forth between Urseg piecing up Pantoja on the feet, and then Pantoja taking him down and wanting to control them, and then there were some scrambles, right? So it, it wasn't, to me, it wasn't like a clear cut, like, oh, Urseg's up like crazy, and Pantoja's up like crazy. This this was a close fight, but if you're looking at damage, which everyone talks about as the top criteria, you know, we know Urseg did the most damage in that fight. But round by round, you could say it was 2-2 going into the fifth. And then in that fifth round, Urseg's going for those takedowns. And, you know, even himself and a lot of us could recognize those takedowns, of course, ended up being a mistake because then he lost position. And then when Pantoja had top control, he was landing some shots there, too. You got to count those ground strikes. That's legit damage. And then if you're doing it round by round and you have it 2-2 going into the fifth, it's understandable Pantoja wins that. I feel like for the most part, a lot of people can understand the 48-47 because there were some close rounds in there, because, you know, there were some blurred lines. But that 49-46 is where people really start to get mad. And I can understand that. Like, it looks, at least watching it, you're like, how could you have it 49-46? Like, it's a huge lead for Pantoja. But remember, when you see those close rounds and you pick Urseg, someone else could pick Pantoja. And then all of a sudden, those rounds rack up. But look, I get it. Because especially with the performance that Urseg put on, you're looking at that and you're like, there's no way he could lose by that much, let alone, you know, lose it all. And people are, are that's how people see it. To me, I really don't think it was that crazy of a robbery just because I had it 2-2 going into the fifth. But I completely get and understand why people thought Urseg won that fight. Like, you could easily give it to him. I wouldn't have been mad if Urseg won that fight at all. Even Urseg acknowledged afterwards and, and understood that that fifth round was going to decide that fight. 
and he understood he didn't do enough but i do understand the frustration from a lot of people because it's like man we talk about damage 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 and you see what urzeg did to pantoja literally at the press conference still bleeding from the cut and you're like how did that guy not win but if we just take a step back for a second and look at what urzeg just did within this year within literally a year had four ufc fights had a three fight win streak gets a nice finish and then within like eight weeks goes and fights the champion and puts it on him like that, all of a sudden, it makes the flyweight division a lot more interesting. And if he can continue, and this rematch becomes extremely more interesting now, or him just getting back to the title fight now, and even him losing, this does not hurt his stock. If anything, the fans are now going to rally more for him because we want to see him get back to that title shot because we think he definitely deserves to be in there because a lot of people think... He should have won that fight. So overall, for Urseg and the whole flyweight division, this was a major positive just in terms of Urseg stock and in terms of looking at the flyweight division differently and, and, and just having more interesting names in the mix now. All right, next up, the King Jose Aldo returning to the UFC in Rio, Brazil. This was a super fascinating story coming into this card. How's he going to look? How's he going to perform? And then if he wins, is he going to make some sort of run at this stage in his career? Like... It's crazy coming from boxing back to MMA. Like, what's Aldo gonna like? So many questions were surrounding this fight, and oh my god, I was shocked by how damn good Aldo looked. Like, from how fresh he looked, from how fast he was, sharp, and then the impact on his shots, like to the body and then the leg, and then like you could hear and see the impact of Aldo's shots. And I'm like, holy shit, this man is looking good. And I'm like, I didn't think he was gonna get like beat up or anything. I didn't think he was gonna look bad, but I'm like. I didn't think he was going to look this good. And on the flip side for Martinez, he looked baffled. Like he was like kind of stunned for a lot of this fight. And he really couldn't let his hands go or, or, or most of his game go at all. Like he was trying to hold on to Aldo. And okay, that didn't really work. And then he would throw some punches, maybe land one. But then it couldn't really throw combos. Couldn't really, you know, do too much and get his game going. And his coaches were saying, you got you to gotta let your hands go. You got to let it fly. Even in that third round. And then... He would have like a couple moments, but it just got completely overshadowed by Aldo's dominance. And then Aldo in that third round near the end clips him and he's wobbled and he's hurt. And you're thinking, holy crap, Aldo's right back in the mix in the top 15 of the Bantamweight division. And I was honestly shocked. After years off doing boxing that you come back to MMA and you dominate like that. Man, that was that was special and great for the Brazil fans. Great timing, the event, his performance, everything fit perfectly. And for Martinez, honestly, I felt bad because look, there's no shame in losing to Jose Aldo, right? I don't care how old he is, but you know, it was more so just about himself, not being able to showcase himself and how good that he could have been. And even afterwards, you could see his frustration because he couldn't really get anything going. And he was just like, damn, I just got shut out. Like I just couldn't, I couldn't let it fly. And huge credit to Jose Aldo for right after having that huge win, go straight to him, you know, and tries to like, you know, console him a little bit. Super impressive seeing Jose Aldo. And now he has some options here. You know, his contract expired. He doesn't even have to go back to the UFC. He can do, his, you know, some other fights or, you know, go back to boxing. So he has options in the UFC and outside the UFC, which I thought was great for Aldo. Now we go to Smith and Petrino. And this was super interesting because... Smith is coming into this fight. A lot of fans are giving him flack, you know, as usual, just because he has a lot of wild takes, but also because they think that he's in over his head, that he is not as good as, you know, he thinks he is. And you can still make that argument. But Anthony Smith, leading up to this fight, you know, was getting a lot of flack from MMA fans. Be like, man, you're not that guy. Like, you're, you know, you're a bum saying all this stuff about him. And like, you're not who you say you are, da 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 your takes are terrible. All, all these things people were saying about Anthony Smith. And he's coming into this fight, not just having to prove, you know, that he's good enough to be Petrino, but he's good enough to be still where he is positioned in the rankings. And for Petrino, this could be a big name guy that you could get a finish over and kind of build your name off of. And we get into the fight and Smith gives a veteran performance, starting with the leg kicks, hurting Petrino, right? Which leads to him wanting to take Anthony Smith down. Doesn't have a clean takedown. So then Anthony Smith cats his neck. And that simple mistake all it takes when you have a veteran guy like Smith, he catches it, and that's it. Fight's over. Smith gets the finish, and he's like, I'm back. I'm good. And it's funny because either way, I think if Petrino won that fight against Smith, people were like, ah, Smith is washed. And then if, you know, Smith won this fight now, and then people are like, ah, Petrino's like, you didn't beat like any big-name guy. He didn't really prove anything. So it's kind of like a lose-lose for both guys no matter what. 
But for Smith, it is get, you know good for him to get back into the win column and kind of prove some of the naysayers wrong. But in terms of being like the top, like top five level guy, you know, we still have to, you know, see if he can still be there, right? Because he hasn't shown that. And for Petrino, there really wasn't any positive to take away from that fight. You know, it is a step back, you know, but he can still climb up and, and, and you know, get there eventually. But for him, you know, this was an opportunity to really take advantage of a big name guy, you know, who people see on the decline and you really missed out on that opportunity. And it was funny because right after the fight, even before Smith's name could be announced as the winner, you already have Pareda posting him making jokes and him like sleeping on Smith's performance. I thought it was hilarious. Classic hater move from Pareda. And then even afterwards, he's like, you know what? I'll put 50 G's up that I'll beat Smith in grappling. And honestly, I'd love to see that. But man, it's just funny how Pareda hates Anthony Smith and you know they got they got their back and forth going but honestly I would love to see that that would be funny all right then we go to Michelle Pereira versus Eeyore and this was probably the craziest thing that happened in the event Michelle Pereira is a wild guy I know that he he is so fun to watch he is a character but what he did against Eeyore was literally like a video game button mashing just bullied him he didn't give any about what Eeyore could do to him. He just bulldozed in, clipped him, and then turns around and backflips. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? He does it again. And then he actually gets a good position, which leads to him getting into a scramble and then getting the submission win. And I'm like, what the hell just happened? Did he actually just do that? Backflip in the top position, then get the finish that quickly? Like, it was literally like a joke. Like, he treated him like a joke. And then what was nuts was there was conversation about, is this going to be like a no contest disqualification or something? Because when Pareda landed on top of Eeyore, his shin hit his face. And you obviously can't uh, knee or kick a grounded opponent. So it's like, oh my God, is he going to have this crazy moment, fantastic win, and then it's going to get turned into a loss or a no contest or whatever? And I'm like, oh my God. It didn't seem to be impactful either. So ultimately, I think, you know, all was good. But in terms of what's next for Michel Pereira, I don't see him doing this to like a top 10 guy. If he does, I'm like, damn, this guy's like, this guy might be the GOAT. Like, if he does this to a top 10 guy, top five guy, like, which I doubt he'll do, then I'm like, yo, this is the, this guy's the man. Because that's where I think it comes from. He didn't respect Eeyore at all. And that's why he did what he did. But I'm like, when he keeps climbing up, I don't think he's going to be doing that you know, all the time. All right, then we go to Paul Craig versus Kyle, and I was hoping this would be a lot more competitive than what it was. Paul Craig was strictly looking for the ground game, was strictly looking for guard play. You know, his striking did not look better at all, especially defensively. Kyle was just basically jumping right on him, hitting him with straight shots, and Paul Craig, you know, was getting hit by the shots. He was too slow and could not adjust, could not, you know, have good head movement in any way. And it was really one-sided on the feet. And eventually, Kyle caught him again, and then Paul Craig lights out, right? And it was fairly disappointing because I was hoping he would be, you know, more competitive. I thought Paul Craig would be able to do better, but, you know, massively impressive for Kyle. I think it's time for him to start moving up a lot now in this division. Big win for him. He was sharp. He pretty much, it was completely one-sided, to be honest, so it couldn't have gone better for Kyle. Um, and he's a pretty fun guy and he's entertaining as well. I like his style. Um, I was hoping there would be more back and forth, but man, big props to Kyle, big win for him. We got to keep putting him up now. All right, then we go to Brito versus Shore. And this is also controversial because look, although it was very one-sided for Brito, those leg kicks were damaging Shore bad. Like it was swelling up like crazy. And I was thinking, is this going to be a TKO by leg kicks again in this card? And then Shore actually properly checks the kick, but then because that kick was so hard and because his legs were so swollen from, you know, eating all the shots before, that hole pops out and I'm like, oh my God, this is bad. Like he has like a hole in his shin and he checked the kick. Like he checked the kick, but because I guess it was so swollen already from eating so many kicks, when he finally did check it properly, bam, that it just opened right up. The hole was there. It was gushing blood. It looked bad. Um, and I understand why the ref, you know, paused it for that moment because he's like, damn, this is, this is like a hole in your leg. But in terms of the stoppage, like, you could, I can understand why people were upset because it's like, look, he was walking fine. He was fighting fine. But then what was wild was when the doctor came in, he's like poking in the hole, being like, let me see what's in there. Let me, let me dig in there. And like, he's like fingering the hole. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, like, what are you doing? But apparently the doctor was saying in Portuguese that, you know, there could be a fracture, right? And that's why he thought the fight should be stopped was because, you know, it seemed like it wasn't just like the cut and the blood. It was like, now his shin is fractured. And then from Jack Shore's side, it seemed like after the fight, he was like applauding and didn't really seem to be protesting the stoppage that much. It seemed like he knew his leg was really hurt bad. 
Um, so honestly, credit to Brito for doing that much damage quickly to Shore because, man, those, those are some nasty kicks. So you got to give him credit as well. But I understand the people who just want to see more violence. Uh, you know, get their joys cut short a little bit. All right, then we go to Brenner versus Mick the Bag. And Mick the Bag has seemed to be this big meme and everyone like loves him and wants to see him succeed, all this stuff. And he honestly came into this fight and he looked phenomenal. He was hurting Brenner bad and had some really good moments in the first and the second round. But when he hurt Brenner, he was taking him down after. And it's like, you have him hurt on the feet, which I know that's not like your number one game plan, but you got him hurt on the feet. Why don't you just keep doing that, right? Or keep going for that. But he goes for the takedown, tries to get control, you know, tries to get a finish, but he, he doesn't get it done in that third round. He's the one getting controlled. And then things are sliding, starting to slide off against him in that direction. And it's like, you missed an opportunity to possibly, you know, finish the fight. And then it's like, you know, could this be a big mistake? Then he grabs the fence and the referee takes a point from him right away. And it was very interesting because usually when the ref takes a point, it's after they, they stop, they break you up and then they take the point away and then they reset. But they let the position stay when he was being controlled and the ref just kind of went like taking a point. So he was in a bad position and he lost the points. So it's like, man, he could, you know, if he loses this round, this could end up being a draw because it could be a 10-8. But then he came up clutch. That knockdown that he got at the end, 100% won him that round. And that was a deciding factor between him getting a draw and then him getting a win. So props to him for having that clutch moment and stay winning. But that was very, very close to being a draw and a big mess up for him. Then we move on to Silva and Close. And although Close won, the craziest moment and you know biggest moment of this fight was when he was caught in a guillotine. And he does a backward slam to try to get out of the guillotine. Then he ends up on the bottom, almost gets submitted. And it's like, you know, he ended up winning the fight. And that's fantastic for him. But... It's like, damn, that was a wild. I've not, I haven't seen that. Like, I don't think I've seen that ever. You're doing a backward slam for yourself to get out of a guillotine. And you end up being in a worse position. Then we go to Rufi and Malarkey. And honestly, just a fantastic, perfect performance and beatdown for Rufi against Malarkey. Malarkey got messed up bad. Uh, feel a little bad for him. But Rufi, man, UFC debut comes in. And the commentary was comparing him to, like, Connor. In terms of, like, honestly, the way he moved a little bit, I can see the comparisons a little bit from him and connor just you know the movement and and the, his stance a little bit at, at times but major props to rufi that was a phenomenal performance he is super fun to watch uh i'm gonna look forward a lot to you know what he does next in his next fight all right so those are my biggest takeaways from ufc 301 uh honestly fantastic card especially for the you know lack of i guess hype factor you can call it um that was it was it was fun to watch it was entertaining a lot of fun moments obviously sucks with the controversy from the main event but let me know what you guys think in the comments below and i will talk to you guys later peace out